going to quite shortly turn this over to uh, Dr. Martin Chasen, who's going to be presenting today on palliative rehabilitation. And uh, the, the format is that he will be uh, he will be doing his presentation, and then uh, once that's once that's done, there will be a discussion with a question and answer period, and it's time for wrapping up. And um, and so please, if you can uh, take notes or any questions that you have, and to keep those for the end of our uh, end of uh, Dr. Chasen's presentation, then that would be great. So. Um, with no further ado, I'm going to uh, hand it over. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Chasen here um, presenting on palliative rehabilitation. It works. Okay. So, well, first of all, I'd really like to say that it's, it's, it's my privilege yeah, to be able to, uh, to speak to this group. Is it good? Can I continue? Okay. Yep, so, so it's my privilege to be able to speak to this group. It's, uh, it's a group that was started a few years ago and it's gone really from strength to strength. And I think uh, Jenny taking over it and bringing it to Toronto and making it part of the whole setup there uh, has uh, really has catapulted it into a new orbit. And uh, hopefully that we will continue to, to move and to move forward and get more people to, to be interested and to join the group and that this collaboration communication that goes on will just continue. So I, I um, came to Canada in 2004 from South Africa, which you may be able to hear, and uh, under the directorship with, uh, and help with Professor Neil MacDonald, who many of you know, we uh, at the McGill uh, um, University in, in Montreal started a program called, Rehab uh, it was then called Cancer Rehabilitation. It uh, really went very, very well, and um, after three or four years, the Quebec government came and recognized this as a priority for cancer and for tr treatment of patients with cancer. And um, initially we had to find a lot of that funding and then after we, we were recognized, the, the hospital ended up having to find funding. And it was at that time that uh, Dr. Jose Pereira here in Ottawa liked the idea very, very much and said um, he'd like to bring the idea to Ottawa. Um, and we started a, a program here in the beginning of 2010 and uh, these are the results and giving you some of the background of how the program works and why it works. And um, hopefully answer any questions and really quite prepared to help anybody at any center that would be interested in, in starting such a program. So the first slide over there, this is a favorite, famous artist of mine. His name is William Kentridge. And he speaks about progression. And I think when we talk about uh, rehabilitation, as you'll see, it is a progression. Sometimes you have to climb up large ladders. Sometimes you've got to make a lot of noise. Sometimes you, you've got to be full of love. But you have to move forward with this progression because it, it do, if it doesn't turn and it doesn't move, uh, it will go backwards. So um, I don't have any affiliation or financial with any type of commercial organization at this time that would have any direct or indirect connection with this presentation. So looking at the definition of, that we worked out in 2008 of what cancer rehabilitation really is, and, and we described it as a process that the, assists the individual with cancer to obtain the maximal physical, social, psychosocial, and vocational functioning um, within the limits that have been created by their disease and its treatment. Now, just of course remembering that vocation doesn't only necessarily mean a, a job, a work. To be a mother or to be a father is also a vocation. So to let the person that's got cancer op uh, function optimally in the various spheres of his or her life. And if we look back at where cancer rehabilitation comes from, it's not new. Um, in the years of the, the early 70s, when they were going to declare a war on cancer and say, how are we going to beat cancer? We're going to put as much money as we can into it, and we're going to develop the best drugs. But at the same time, and this was a little, uh, a little hidden behind the drugs and, and, and the, the magic bullets, they started the, 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 the NCI sponsored a National Cancer Rehabilitation Planning Conference, and that was already held in 1972. And, and the idea behind this was that each and every patient should really opti have optimized their level of physical functioning, um, psychosocial functioning, and with the necessary psychosocial support, the, the different vocational uh, counseling that, that would enable the patient to uh, interact with their environment, and of course, 
maximize the level of social function. And now, so why social? Well, if you if you consider that somebody that's had that's got a had an esophagectomy, or somebody that's got a colostomy, and now this person specifically wants to go out to a restaurant to eat, can you only just imagine the problems of the noises, the slow eating, the looks, that type of social functioning to to get that. Um, uh, into the public eye. And the first one they did was, of course, the alopecia. And, uh, and bring it to, to light that if somebody's losing their hair, it's not the worst thing um, in the world. And there were very many groups, as you can recall and remember, that uh, actually just shaved off their hair. And, and it's still present today. But that was all led on by this uh, rehabilitation conference. And if we have a look at DT, he came along with this model, um, and this was in 1981. And he developed this model, of, which was specific to oncology, including these four goals of rehabilitation. And they were determined according to the particular disease and the treatment that was given to the patients. So, it was so much so that in the preventative phase, the term uh, endeavors to avert certain problems that could be anticipated through, like amongst other things, education before an intervention, such as a person undergoing a lung resection um, putting them through a program of walking and exercise in order to maximize their cardiorespiratory function. In, a, in the restorative phase, uh, this uh, term treats disabilities through, for example, uh, rehabilitation inventions, interventions on recovery after a hemiparesis from a brain tumor, or the training and the use and the care of the prosthesis following an amputation. Um, during the supporter phase, this uh, doesn't really fo focus only on this duration, restoration of the initial functioning, but rather on maximizing, and I think this is key, maximizing the level of functioning, and that's through the use of com compensatory techniques or technical aids, where the person has now, for instance, lost that leg, and you're going to be providing the prosthesis, you're going to look after that prosthesis, he, unless you, uh, you, you, know, you can't really maximize that function as he was when he had both legs, but you maximize what's left. You know, it's a kind of a thing that I always say, if you've got a pair of diamond earrings and you lose the one earring, what do you do with the other one? Do you also just throw it away or do you care for it and you shine it and you polish it and you really treasure it? And uh, more specifically, and I think this is coming to the fore, specifically when we look at a patient-oriented outcome. You know, what does the patient want? And that's in the palliative care phase is that to maintain the level of functioning in the areas that are a priority for the patient. Even if he's got progression of disease, there, is, there are many goals um, that once you speak to the patient and you see what are their goals, how can you maximize what is left behind? And so this, this model became known as the, uh, uh, the DEET rehabilitation model. So um, generally, well, the way we look at it, and we kind of think that the, um, the main problem that associated with cancer rehabilitation is that, that you need to continually adjust and readjust the goal of intervention um, according to the progression of the disease. For example, a, an individual with stomach cancer within the space of a few months um, may be given information and a preventative exercise program before surgery. Um, a few weeks after the, uh, the operation, the program should be reviewed and then the rehabilitation may target getting back into shape before the chemotherapy begins. And, and then the, the goals of rehabilitation are to maintain the patient's weight and his functional capacity. So, and, and it's interdisciplinary. It empowers those individuals who are experiencing all these um, symptoms and signs um, associated with the cancer or treatment. And the main aim is to empower the patients to improve their own quality of life. As we know, the, the three worst things that patients fear are um, abandonment, you know, uh, if, uh, if, uh, fear, um, helplessness, hopelessness, abandonment, as I said, you know, and, and whatever we can do through this interdisciplinary shared objective to prevent those three things coming through, um, that would be our goal. So when we look at the interprofessional approach, who is it? It's the physician, it's the nurse, it's a dietitian, physiotherapist, an OT, social worker, psychologist, anybody in fact who has something to bring to the table to help that patient and their family improve their own quality of life um, and, and to bring their expertise. And I think this is the key of, of any rehabilitation team 
is to um, say that sometimes the patient will, uh, the physician is in charge, and at other times that same patient, the, the occupational therapist may be in charge, the physiotherapist, and it depends where that patient fits best. And that you only get when you've got a face-on-face -face meeting with a whole team. So when you assess the patient, patient I mean, there, there are lots of things that we, we like to assess. We like to assess their symptoms, you know, um, how are they functioning with their prosthesis, with the stoma, um, how fatigued are they? We, as we know, the three main um, complaints or, or problems that patients present with advanced cancer is PDF, pain, depression, and fatigue. And what we try to do is to obviously is to evaluate that pain, depression, and fatigue so that we know that objectively what we are measuring to add in the intervention and then to objectively measure it again. And I think this objectivity and, and proper measurement, scientific measurement, is the way forward, not only when you measure a, a tumor response, but now we're looking at patient response, patient symptoms, patient-oriented outcomes. Why is the ESAS as important that in each and every cancer center in Ontario, the ESAS is a standard requirement? It's because the majority of our patients have advanced disease, are receiving palliative treatments, and what should be, we should be measuring the patients the pain, the depression, the fatigue, the, um, the lack of appetite, the constipation, and all these other symptoms, anxiety, depression. So these patient assessments are very important. And so I'm just going to go through a few um, areas of, 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 uh, of how we're assessing and what we're assessing, and let's look at the nutrition. What does the dietitian do? So the role of the dietitian is really she makes an assessment of every patient that's referred to this program and provides them and their caregivers with information on how to maximize the intake of calories and protein. Protein is very important. So she takes the, the patient's level of phys physical activity into consideration, and particularly if they're involved in a fitness program in, in the physiotherapy, so that they would not lose weight as a result of the program. She helps patients manage their own GI symptoms, you know, um, for instance, uh, constipation is a, is a big problem with patients with advanced cancer, the inactivity, the lack of intake, the drugs, uh, etc. And this is a big, big cause of, of many of the, of the um, dietary problems is just plain constipation and that's measured. So the, the dietitian also takes part in, in the psychological re-education groups and in the group of natural caregivers which both focus on nutrition the caregivers are very interested in what they should be providing for the patient. And the psychosocial aspect of any meal, as we know, is important because the patient could sit down with the family the first day and the wife says, darling, I've, I've really made your best food. And he says, I'm just not hungry. And they come the next day and that whole process is repeated. And after one week, that patient is now not sitting at the table anymore, sitting in the, in the, in the bedroom or sitting in the living room and the social interaction is gone. So that kind of caregiver interaction is very important. And why is weight loss so, so important? Because just have a look at the frequency of, of weight loss. I mean, these patients, gastric and pancreas and lung cancer and prostate, all of these patients have significant amount of weight loss um, prior, to the, you know, prior to them dying. But the, we've got over here six months, and look at the, the red represents 10%. But it's, it carries on, it, it starts really probably earlier than six months before. But just look, 38% weight loss in measurable gastric cancer. That's greater than 10%. And when we look at the next slide, you see, well, why is it important? Well, those patients that have more weight loss have a worse quality of life. So this has been shown a long time ago. So we know that th this is very instrumental, and if we can target this, then we should be able to help. And what do we know? Let's look at some of the trials here. Does nutrition influence the quality of life in patients uh, that have got cancer or are undergoing radiation therapy? You know, accounting for the nutritional status, individualized counseling, and the counseling is key. And I'm going to show you some, uh, some studies showing that it's actually that face-to-face -face counseling because each and every patient is an individual. When are the smells, which smells are going to affect you? Which meals are best? Would you eat better in the morning? Do you eat better in the afternoon? Should you eat before the exercise, after the exercise? How big should that meal be? And which are your preferences? Each person is different. It's not a one-size-fits-all. So we're just looking here at the improvement in functional aspect of quality of life correlated with adequate or improved nutritional intake. 
And I, I'm going to show you so much more that the American Society of Parental and Enteral Nutrition actually came out with a, a firm statement that all patients undergoing um, uh, should have a nutritional screening as a component of their initial assessment. That's all patients with advanced cancer that should come into the clinic should have an initial screening. It's not me, this is a big organization saying that. And looking further to see wh what are some of those outcomes and why do they say that, is that the same Paula Rivasco published this in 2005 in the JCO, not, not a, a bad journal, you know, 111 patients with colorectal cancer. Okay, some of them were earlier stage, but 66 um, out of those 111 had advanced stage cancer. And they were randomized to either receive nutritional counseling with regular food, or they received just a protein supplementation, two cans a day, or 37 just received regular diet. So there was, that was the randomization. And looking further how they went, that 15 in group, were malnourished um, in group one, and 14 in group two, and 13 in malnourished in group three. So those, once again, the, the groups were nutritional counseling, um, protein supplementation, and just regular diet. And at three months, there was additional nutritional degeneration in group two and group three relative to group one. And that was statistically significant. So really beginning to show you that that nutritional counseling is a key, um, a key component of treatment. So at the end of the trial, the group one who had the nutritional counseling had a calorie intake increase by 550 kilocalories a day, as opposed to 296 and uh, 285. So there was an increase in calorie intake, but there certainly those patients having that nutritional counseling had statistically significant a better calorie intake than the others. And at three months, we see that the quality of life was maintained or improved in group one, maintained or deteriorated in group two, and quality of life just deteriorated in group three. Once again, the three groups, group one was those that had having nutritional counseling face to face with a, a, a competent dietitian, group two having a caloric intake uh, supplementation, and group three um, no supplementation and no uh, nutritional counseling, just told to continue with a regular diet. Okay, let's see what the occupational therapist does. So the goals of the occupational therapist are really, I mean, we, we're very privileged to have occupational therapists, and uh, w w what do they really do? So they look at rehabilitation in terms of everyday activities. You know, the, uh, they work with the physiotherapist they, in order to increase this patient's functional capability and physical fitness evaluating the patient's ability to carry out the, the ADLs, activities of daily living, and with patients and in tandem, they determine which activities are a priority. So once again, asking the patient, what do they want? What are their goals? What are your priorities? If your priority is not to get out of bed, well, I'm not going to force you to get out of bed. I'm going to suggest that, that in order to do what you want to do, you should try and get out of bed. You know, and, and how do you work ergonomically? What is the best way to conserve your energy? And um, other things that we, we now do with occupational therapists is specifically a patient education programs for peripheral um, neuropathy that are for chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. Difficulties in sleeping that, uh, that the OTs definitely have a, a, a role to play. Um, in addition to what the nurse and the psychologist and whoever else is working, working in tandem with all these people. And the physioterrorist, I mean physiotherapist, Let's see what this great lady does, because the program is really um, based on physiotherapy and alongside um, the physiotherapists or the other groups that work in and around, because the exercise program is important. We use exercise, and this is not actress, it's just we know that exercise is the best antidote and the best treatment we have in order to improve patients' physical capabilities and functional status. You know, uh, fatigue, that's it, and all our patients are fatigued. So exercise works best. She would, the, the physio would perform an assessment of the patient and then set up a specific exercise program that will address the specific needs. Programs include strengthening and aerobic fitness exercises and often has to find ways to deal with specific problems, a lack of balance. Patients are too weak or they may have had a brain tumor or they may be just so deconditioned that their balance, their el being elderly, their balance is bad, some localized pain or post-op decrease in range of movement, 
and of course the exercises are all geared and have the goal to increase the patient's functional independence. Uh, the patients were able to attend our two week uh, by week the group sessions led by the physiotherapist, and she. So we have a, this particular group, and her aim there is to help patients adapt to a new lifestyle habit. Engaging in a program of regular physical exercise, which I'm going to bring and show you why it's important, and then also stresses the importance of maintaining that lifestyle habit even after the program has ended. And, and what is our rationale really for exercise? Let's have a look. What do we think about this? So we know that there are a number of epidemiological studies that have shown that regular exercise, and that's um, more than nine metabolic equivalent tests or hours per week, um, uh, is associated with a decline in 15% to 61% in the risk of mortality attributed to cancer and of mortality as well, irrespective of the cause. Following, we've seen it in breast cancer, in prostate cancer, and um, operable colorectal cancer. And I'm going to show you one of these studies. So this is the, also published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology just two years ago. And uh, this is quite an interesting study, if you have a look what this was about. So in order to be eligible for the study, patients had to have, obviously, a histological confirmation of grade, uh, stage 3 or 4 um, recurrent glioma. Um, these were high-grade, either the multiform, glioblastoma multiformal or the anaplastic um, astrocytoma or anaplastic oligodendroglioma. And they have, would have received and would still be receiving salvage therapy. So this was second or third line. And they had to be over the age of, eight, of 18, have a Konoski performance state of 70, at least at the beginning of the study, um, the ability to read and understand English, and no other contraindications. And just to remind you that a KPS of 70 means caring for self, but uh, unable to carry out normal activity or to do active work. Um, you know, this is the palliative performance scale of about 70. So, you know, in the ECOG, it's between a 2 and a 3. And um, I'm just going to show you just a little bit of what this exercise behavior is, you know, because I think that's quite important for you to see. It's that um, these metabolic equivalent tasks, the normal pace at 2 to, mile, two to 3 miles per hour, is the three hours, it gives you a met of 3. Whereas if you're running faster than 10 minutes, you get 12. Um, if you're playing tennis, you get 7. If you're doing yoga, you get 4. And if you're just mowing the lawn, which is quite vigorous, you get a, a score of 6. And so the, furthermore to that, the, the statistical analysis was quite interesting is that they used the Cox proportional risk model. And then a likelihood test, uh, ratio test, was also used in, the, in this context and it was to measure the contribution of walk distance and exercise behavior. Now, we're going to speak about exercise behavior, but this was used in order to predict survival beyond that which was predicted by the performance status or the age and sex and stage and number of prior therapies. And we looked at, they looked at the, what the functional capacity was, et cetera. And just looking at this, we see that, six, that there were 243 patients, so 65% agreed to participate um, and took part in the study until its end. And interestingly enough, there was no independent association between the six-minute walk test and survival. It did not provide any incremental prognostic f f uh, information about those with the normal traditional prognosis, pro uh, markers of prognosis. They, the average age was 49 years, the KPS average was seven, it was 90, and the average for the six-minute walk test was 448 meters. 26% of patients um, reported that they actually did more than 150 minutes per week of exercise, and this was of moderate or strenuous, while a quarter of them, 24%, reported that they did no exercise. The median six-minute walk test in each uh, w w did not really provide any incremental in prognostic information, is what I've said. So looking on what happened with the exercise behavior, and this really showed that it was an independent predictor of survival with a p-value of 0 0.008. There was a significant difference between these gr two groups, and it was cut off at nine metabolic equivalent task hours per week. So that those who did less than nine had a median survival of 13 months, and those that did more than nine met hours per week 
had a survival of 21.84. In other words, the more exercise, the greater probability of survival. So exercise is not a suggestion. Exercise should really become what I call a prescription for patients with advanced cancer. So we know that the, the other randomized trials that have really shown that training with structured exercise is safe, it's well tolerated, and it's a therapy for patients with cancer, both during and after primary therapy. And we're not sure 100% how it works, but it modulates, could modulate systemic factors, metabolic changes, steroid hormones, immune surveillance, cytokine, angiogenic reductors. There's, there's a wide range of the effects of exercise having on, um, on the amygdaloid, uh, uh, looking in, in the brain at how it modulates mood and motivation. Um, there's a, really, there's a, a lot. There's a new book that's actually just come out. It's a bestseller called Spark, looking at children that exercise before they go to school. These are not patients with cancer, but uh, children going to school and how their general performance increases uh, statistically wise if they do exercise before they, if they start classes in the morning. So what about this? Why, why was the six-minute walk test really not associated with survival? While we know that it has been associated in patients with non-small cell lung cancer, so we're not quite sure why this didn't come out, but it seems as if the behavior is more important than the, um, the, than the walk test, which is really a measure of endurance. And let's have a look at our, what our nurse does, because she's also a vital player um, in this whole uh, team work. So the patient really, she really discovers how the patients view their disease. She assesses the impact that the disease has on the patient's life and the way they're leading their life. What are the symptoms? She goes ahead and informs them about the various resources that are available to provide them with continual support. She has, the nurse really par excellence has extensive contact with the patient and the family and is most often the point um, person of which the family will then contact. They're now at home. They suddenly see that the, their pain has gone from a 2 out of 10 to a 4 out of 10 within one day. The nurse would be the first person who would then advise the patient what to do and allow and explain to the patient that should this happen again, the way forward would be to treat yourself. Have the, have the ability to recognize the symptom and to have your own intervention. So um, going along with the, uh, you know, the sleep hygiene, which is, you know, that 45% of our patients don't sleep. So it's almost half of those, and those patients that don't sleep have worse symptoms. So we're not sure whether it's the worst symptoms not causing the sleep or the not sleep causing the worst symptoms. And then, of course, we have our social worker who really is a, also a wonder. I can say everybody's just such a vital part in the team, but the social worker um, is frequently consulted when psychosocial problems are identified by other team members. So she'll originally assess all the patients, but not would not specifically have a role for each and every patient and it's specifically requested. And she helps the patient and the family to cope with a lot of the illness, to uh, look at the different problems that, evolve, that are evolving and to help solve them, and then also to see what are the necessary financial resources that are available. Um, and giving that psychosocial patient for the patients and their families, looking at anxiety, what, what family relationships uh, involve. You know, when a patient has cancer, it's, it's about loss. You know, you, you, you lose your hair, you, you can lose your breast, you lose your independence, and you, you lose your job. Very often you lose a spouse. So it's about loss. And I think what, what we want to do with rehabilitation is say, well, that's enough loss. Let's take what we have, let's stop there, and, and stop the loss, stop the hemorrhage. And I think the social worker has a, a vital role to play in that, um, in that field. So just looking at the role of social support, and I, I think this is really very, very interesting studies uh, that I'm going to show you. This, this came out just two years ago, the marital status and survival in patients um, with, with cancer. And uh, the objective was to see and to and try and work out what is the impact of marital status on patients, um, what is at the stage of diagnosis, the use of uh, definitive therapy, who had, who didn't have, what was the cancer-specific mortality associated with this, you know, and uh, looking to see what was the cancer-specific mortality. And 
what they saw that this table shows the forest plots, which were showing the odds ratios and confidence intervals for the association between marital status and presentations with metastatic disease, the association with marital status and the use of definitive therapy, and the association between marital status and cancer-specific mortality in each of 10 cancers. And after adjustment for the demographics, we see that married patients were less likely to present with metastatic disease than those who were not married. And this p-value was 0 0.001, an odds ratio of 0.83. And the, the tumor, and after adjusting for demographics and tumor nodal status, ma married patients with non-metastatic disease were also more likely to undergo more definitive surgical or radiotherapeutic management than unmarried patients. And once again, after adjusting for the demographics, tumor, and nodal stages and the use of definitive therapy, patients who were married were significantly less likely to die of their disease with a, with a hazard ratio of 0.8 and a P of 0 0.001. So quite significant. And this is, when you're looking at the unmarried cohort, and they were stratified according to the respective components, either never married, separated, divorced, or widowed, all the subgroups of unmarried patients were more likely to present with metastatic disease, to be undertreated, and to die of their cancer than their married counterparts. And this was yeah, 0 0.001. And, um, and the effect of marital status was, was greater for men. So, Looking at we say that the unmarried patients were then significantly greater risk of presentation of metastatic disease under treatment and death resulting from their cancer. So it, it, it is quite interesting that the study really suggests that unmarried patients with any malignancy represent at an at-risk population that really may benefit from targeted support-based intervention. And I, I think it's just important that I, I put uh, two testimonials in here so that we can see what, how the patients feel and what they feel about it. So they say this one says, <clears throat> a diagnosis of cancer is life-changing. For the individual and their family, people change. All energies are directed towards fighting the disease. You're fighting the disease. This is a big battle. The world outside recedes as you redirect every iota of your being towards the fight of your life. It is easy to lose perspective at this time, you know, from, because you, we know this from your work with cancer patients and their families, and our participation in the palliative rehabilitation program has been a gift. In eight short weeks, you have helped us to move the focus away from the disease that has consumed us and rediscover the balance in living. The benefits of interacting with others in the same situation Finding support and solace in the company of companions in the journey has been most helpful piece. So I'll just say one thing on that before we read on is that what we find is that when the patients get into the gym, they start talking to one another. And this has been specifically for men who don't really want to come to the program to meet other patients. Once they start talking to others, that social network just develops. And after a week or two, they're organizing carpools amongst one another. So having a destination to look forward to twice a week knowing we'd be greeted by friendly faces who were genuinely interested in our care was also very encouraging and something to look forward to. And I, I really, I think this one expresses a lot of what I, I think is patients enjoy and what they want um, from this program. And it's that, um, I feel I've been remiss in not writing to you sooner. I cannot say enough about how positive I felt being involved in your team. The thing that impressed me most was your profound respect for me. I think that this was only surpassed by the admiration and the respect you had for each other. This allowed me to open up and be more trusting, and I knew that anything I shared of value and significance was relayed to other team members. My wife and I were no longer on our own. Simple things seemed to take on profound meaning. You need to eat more or don't feel guilty about resting. You don't have to endure the pain. That's why we give you medication are a few, things of the, a few of the things that come to mind. And as I write, I realize that the most important thing was that we felt we were part of a team, and that made all the difference. So let's have a look what our re rehabilitation program has done. And once again, just to go over what we said, that the palliative rehabilitation program's <coughs> goal 
is to enhance the physical, psychological, social, and professional well-being of the patient, taking into consideration the limitations imposed by the disease or the treatment. These are our goals to empower patients who are experiencing the different symptoms um, to take control, to keep patients as active as possible, and to target patient-specific problems through assessment and treatment, making it a patient-centered approach. And this is the way forward. We know what CPAC are saying. We know what the rest of Canada are saying. Look what the patient wants. Take this patient on his own journey. So this really falls and fits into, into our goal. We have uh, at the Elizabeth Brewer, which is a small rehabilitation hospital, we have uh, six clinical team members. There's a doctor, a nurse, PT, OT, dietitian, and social worker. And this is how we do it. The patients will come in. Um, they will, be, we tell the first visit, they'll see all the, the uh, specialities for a half an hour each, the OT, PT, dietitian, the doctor, the nurse. Initially, we had a psychologist, but we felt that not every patient needs a psychologist that the majority of cases and, 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 and adjustment problems can be helped by a good nurse and a good social worker, and that the more complex problems um, that would be for a psychologist. And putting the patient and the fam caregiver at the middle of the center, we then each person evaluates, and at the end of the, day of the session, we all get together and discuss each patient individually. So we see where the problems are. And interestingly enough, and I'm sure you find this too, is that the patient may tell me one thing and tell the nurse something completely different than the OT something even more different. And what we work, at, what we work out at the end of our, our consultation is that really there's probably one of the team members that clicks best with the patient and they kind of take control of that specific patient. And then once a week, we evaluate and we are brought up to date on how the patients are progressing in this eight-week program. We get patients that come from GPs, oncologists, surgeons, um, some of them from the tumor panels. Uh, you could get patients that come from the, the, uh, the uh, in Quebec, they called it the, the insarnier pivot, the nurse, the patient nurse that's in the clinic, in disease-specific uh, nurse, um, and others, and if we want physios, dietitians, but they must have an attending physician, and these attending physicians re retain their responsibility for the patients. Um, we don't take over control of the patients. We don't change the most. We, we don't become the most responsible physician at all. Patients will patients will be seen after that initial consultation. We'll get a letter back to the physician, <clears throat> and if, the, if there are problems in between, there's communication at the end of the program. The reassessments will also be shown. And these are the general criteria for admission: 18 years old, have a relatively good performance status finished anti cancer treatment but still living with disease and needing assistance in a two areas. Um, they could be fatigued and have pain, uh, be fatigued and have severe depression, um, what, whatever, not eating properly, uh, but at least two so that it's a multidimensional. And then the procedure which I've already explained to you. And we just actually published this just recently in Current Oncology showing that the uh, the effect of this palliative rehabilitation, oncology rehabilitation, um, has an effect on function and pre predictors of program completion. This is a slightly updated, which I'm going to show you today. And, and this is our team. This is in Elizabeth Brewer. Uh, we have a, a, a clinical research assistant, a nurse, physiotherapist, occupational therapist, dietitian, social worker, um, and then, of course, the manager, who is so important, and, and then the, the, the clerk. You know, with, without somebody to organize these appointments that they happen on time, it, it could be disastrous. If we don't know that the patient should be seen the OT at 2 o'clock and the physio at 2.30 and the, and the dietitian at, two, at, at 3 o'clock, that organization is absolutely vital to the patient. So each and every person playing a, a very important role. And our objective is to estimate this effect of the palliative rehabilitation program on the functional, nutritional, social, and psychological function, and then to see if there's any medical factors um, that could be associated with program completion. And so this is what we had. You know, initially we also had some early stage disease when we started the program. You go out to your colleagues and say, please, we're looking for patients. And so they may send one or two, and it doesn't help to say it's the wrong patient. So we took the patients with earlier stage, but as the program's gone on, we we obviously not taking them. And we're looking now specifically more at the advanced stage, stage three and four. 
and uh, which was 85% of the patients. And we see that uh, 11, 19 or 11 percent didn't. They were referred to us, but we didn't assess them as being eligible for the program. And we had 25 percent that did not complete the program, which I'll show you later. And we had 63 percent that actually completed the eight-week program. And this is some of the reasons for not completing. They, you know, deceased. Um, disease progression, and that's the majority. You can see 76% of those that didn't complete or geographically inaccessible. The patient may be referred to us and has got to drive two or three hours to get here into Ottawa and just not really appropriate. So this program that works should really be out in the community, and I think it could be in the community. It's not, a, it's not something that needs high tech. It needs human beings and, and people to talk to one another. So I think it's a great program for the community. Um, we had one patient that never started because he came, he said he thinks he's too well, so he never started the program. And a, a spread of diseases, breast cancer, and that's by word of mouth because, uh, you know, page, one patient has, undergoes the program, sits in the, in the waiting room waiting for the doctor, and the next minute speaks to her friend over there, and says, oh, great program. So then they ask the doctor to refer them. Hematological, it, it really works very well for patients. We've had patients coming in where they uh, are, going to undergo, are going to undergo a bone marrow transplantation. We assess and tell the doctor, you know, do you realize this patient can walk only 100 meters or is so, so, so severely isolated that they'll never cope? So we've helped and the hematologicals do well. I treat head and neck cancer, so we've had a great deal amount there. But otherwise, this is not a, a select group. It's just what was referred to us. And, and looking at, what, at some of the outcomes, I mean, the, this is a, just a T-test. Looking at, uh, we don't do so well on pain, and that's not new, but on tiredness, on depression, on anxiety, appetite, nausea, well-being. And well-being is a very important factor because we know that, and, and a lot of this was uh, Lisa Barbara's work that she actually showed, that what happens to the ESAS six months before the patient dies? It really remains quite static until six weeks before the patient dies, and then everything just gets worse. Well, what we are showing over here is that we actually can change the ESAS. We can make the ESAS look better. And well-being is the biggest predictor of patients that are going to end up in the emergency room. So when we see a well-being that's, uh, that's not getting better, we, we get very worried about those patients. So we can change ESAS. The MDASI, it looks at patients, so you ask the patient, how does this <coughs> the disease or the treatment affect your general activity, your mood, your work, your relationships, your walking, your enjoyment, and looking at those p-values between T1 and T2, they're statistically significant. The multidimensional fatigue uh, inventory, which we're now looking at specifically what is your general fatigue, your physical, your mental, your decreased activity, decreased motivation, and this is measured um, by the patient who fills in a, a, a questionnaire. So we do it at time one and at time two, and once again, really, all right, mentally we, we don't seem to be making much of a difference there. Maybe it's the patient's but certainly making a big difference in, in the other parameters of fatigue. So fatigue, we, we do make a difference. And so, yes, that's great, people will say, but that's just what the patient's writing. But what are you actually measuring? You know, we want to measure something. So what about the reach forward? The Berg balance. We're improving these patients better. And the six-minute walk test. I mean, that's pretty gold standard to say. Well, you know, we know that increasing 40 meters is, is a statistically significant increase. And these patients went from just under 370 to about 415. So they really are getting better. they would be able to walk longer. And, and we know this is important for patients to be able to move around. That makes, it does make all the difference. And nutrition. Our patients have a PGSGA, patient-generated subject, subject to global improvement. And we know that anything above nine means these patients need urgent dietary intervention. And from beginning until end, we see an improvement, statistically a significant improvement in nutrition. And we, we try to find reasons for and, and predict who's going to finish the program, who's able to finish the program. So we're looking at CRP, which is a marker of inflammation, which we know is prognostic and should be done on all patients, and white cells. So Maybe we just didn't have enough patients in order to predict this. And a coping thermometer and distress thermometer, 
you know, it's my personal opinion, and that's probably Canada. We have the best people in Canada that worked out that distress is the fifth vital sign. And how much of a, how many people are doing the distress thermometer with a Canadian symptom checklist? And the patients are severely distressed. Look at this, and we improve the distress. How does this help? How do we decrease the distress? That each person, you know, we'll see this patient and the patients will say, I don't have any dietary problems. And we measure and there are no dietary problems. And at the end of the program, even though there were no dietary problems, somehow their dietary intervent their dietary assessment improves. And the OT and the physio and the psychiatrist, it all works. So I think what we're saying is we seem to have fostered an environment of healing. That's the best that I can say. So distress goes down. Coping is much better. And at the, we have a look, patients were more likely to complete the program if their CRP was normal, but we're not yet there. I think that's just a power. We just need more numbers. Um, the white cell count equals were not significant predictors at this time. And this, this is the latest update. This I took um, probably about a month ago just so that I could have a look. And we have a look. We've had so far 264 patients referred. 90% uh, have started the program. 60% once again have, have um, completed the program. So we're getting better at selecting who can start the program, but we're only at 60%. So this is something we need to work on. Um, and those 6% uh, uh, deceased, disease progression um, to such an extent that the patients weren't able to complete the program, geographic inaccessible, just that one patient who, who was too well, some personal unknown reasons, um, and then one patient was... Uh, the patients struggle to complete this program if they have a, a, a severe um, treatment, uh, like they would be undergoing a Folfox or a Folfiri or a McDonald's. So the, the, the intensive chemotherapy combinations uh, therapies um, don't allow a patient to properly complete this. And so we really showed that there were statistically significant improvements in fatigue, in nutritional status, in symptoms that were interfering with patients on their mood, on the enjoyment of life, their general activity, their walking and their work, and on many other symptoms, which I've shown you on the ESAS, as well as their balance, their function, and possibly their, their performance status. And no patients experience, really experienced worsening of symptoms in any domain, and I, I think that's also significant. This is, it was not a, a symptom burden um, or a, an additional symptom burden on the patient by coming to the program. We unfortunately do work in a hospital there where, where parking is at a premium, so we try and you know, help the patients uh, and get a parking place and pay for that parking. But that, I think, is quite bothersome to patients, and uh, I would imagine that uh, in most hospitals, parking is a problem. And the improvements that we're seeing, because as I explained, they, they can't, they, they're in contrast to the usual pattern that are seen in patients with advanced cancer where we see the steady burden of symptoms increasing until the final um, final weeks of life. So they support the view that palliative rehabilitation is beneficial. Now, following on the famous Temel article where we showed that patients having an early palliative care referral, which was a, a referral with a physician and a nurse, um, whereas we're giving the whole gamut, but the physician and nurse statistically improved the patient's survival, and over and, over and above the survival benefit, patients actually received less chemotherapy. So we are saying that's with two members of the team. It should be a lot better with more members of the team. So we would think that that would follow. And this has led now to a, you know, there's a, there's a, a we just managed to get a CIHR grant looking at multimodal therapy. So its patients will be receiving chemotherapy and randomized them to a C, receive, in addition, an exercise program, uh, uh, nutritional uh, uh, supplementation with EPA, which is a uh, you know, vitamin E, a cosopentenoic acid, and an anti-inflammatory drug, um, which we're going to be using ibuprofen. And this is, in, we're doing it in conjunction, in, in, we have in Canada three investigators, which is myself, I'm the PR, we have Vicky Barracus in, in Alberta, and uh, Thomas Jago in, at McGill, and then we're working in connection with, this, uh, in, with, with investigators in, in Scotland and in Norway. So it's a, it's a national, international study. And so we're looking to see does, what happens to those patients if you, if you follow up, are the, are the gains, uh, are we able to, to maintain, and are those gains that the patients have being sustained? And 
We've got limited data on that. Andrea Feldstein is actually looking at that. She's seen, I think, 20 patients at the three-month mark, and we've seen that anxiety and depression seem to still be um, maintained. The, the lower levels of anxiety and depression are still maintained. So it's still very early days, but we're looking to see, is this sustainable, and how has the effect um, main, uh, help the patients. One of the things that we did show in Quebec is that patients that were on a program never went to the emergency room. We kept them out of the emergency room. So I think that's important. And so um, as I finish off the talk, uh, what I think the message of this to us all is that there is some light at the end of the tunnel. You know, patients were told 10 years ago if they had metastatic colorectal cancer, your median survival is six months and there's not much more that we can do. And now you're living 18 months. You're still going to die of your disease. And, but we're not saying to you there's nothing we can do. There's a lot we can do. There's a lot we can help you to do for yourself. You know, and, and, and if you can be empowered, you know, that you won't feel once again helpless, hopeless, or abandoned, then we've done our job. So this is a program, and I think the message should go out. It's it can be done locally, it can be done in the, in, the, in the community, it's rehabilitation, it's moving after chemotherapy, it's, it's not saying to a patient that, you know, you failed the treatment, rather that the treatment has failed you, but we can still help. And that's the light at the end of the tunnel. There's still a lot that can be done, and, and we want to do it. So um, I'm quite happy, sorry, I've gone a little bit uh, over what I wanted to do, but we started a little late. So I'm happy to take some questions if there are. Thank you very much.